ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the ICA Open Day. Um, my name is Phil, and I'm your warm-up man for this morning. So, a quick overview, and I guess most people in the room will know this anyway, because you are in the industry, although there might be a small minority of you who are here because you want to get into the industry. And when I talk about the industry, I guess I'm talking about compliance. And that, and that in some ways, spans a number of industries. Traditionally, it has been a very strong discipline in the world of financial services. What we are finding now in International Compliance Association is that more and more people are coming to us from various other industries like pharmaceuticals, healthcare, uh, uh, oil and gas, a range of other industries where compliance is growing in importance. But that said, we still find probably 70% plus people are in the world of financial services. Um, just before I delve into the detail of the slide, I am getting ahead of myself. Um, I did say that I would explain that you're getting two for the price of one today. Um, International Compliance Association, who you have seen with all of the branding around, is the not-for-profit professional membership and awarding body. And I will talk a little bit about the role that we play in the qualifications that you are interested in finding out more about. International Compliance Training, and my three colleagues here on the front row who head up the various disciplines that you're going to hear about today, is the commercial arm of ICA and provides the training and the learning management systems, and they will tell you all about the things that they do there. So, back to these industry trends. I guess you can see the big stuff in blue. Uh, the detail that supports it... Um, look at at your leisure. Robert Walters will go into a bit more detail. Um, I confess that this is a slightly different source. This is Barclay Simpson's most recent uh, report on the market. And, and as you can see, generally speaking, after a huge upward climb with many of the big firms, again, banks tending to lead the way, but not exclusively, um, the recruitment drive for professionals in compliance has been huge. That continues. Possibly not at the same rate of acceleration, but it is still growing. Um, we, we find that actually because of that demand for talent, over a quarter of compliance professionals report that they have moved jobs in the last 12 months. Now, that is either they've moved jobs within their organization because they've picked up other responsibilities or they've been promoted, or alternatively, that they've moved jobs outside their organization. That has some good news for salary figures, as you will see there, and other benefits. Um, the one that struck me as a little bit disappointing, but I can clearly see we're putting that right today, was there has been a drop in the proportion of women in compliance roles, although it's a very small number, and Barclay Simpson, when you look at the details, say that there was a blip about two years ago, and that kind of feeds through as people are moving into senior roles. I'm going to guesstimate there's about 60% of women in the room today. So we're on a mission to put that right. So that's great. Um, the other interesting thing is that compliance professionals are still self-reporting that based on the feedback they get from their employers and also from their regulators, that they are perceived as adding increasing amounts of value. And clearly that's you know, a profession to be in where the regulator in your employer is recognizing the value that you bring. But I'm sure as the guys will talk about, that value has changed, that value has evolved and continues to evolve going forward. Um, but that said, people are not necessarily complacent about the fact that the world is rosy in compliance and therefore it's gonna continue. Um, people are more and more making the decision about how do I stay cutting edge, how do I develop myself, how do I make sure that I am the chosen candidate. And I guess I'm preaching to the converted because you wouldn't be here today finding out about development opportunities if you didn't recognize some truth in that. So, quickly answering the question that I posed earlier, who are International Compliance Association? Um, you can see from the icons around the global map here some of the key statistics that emphasize that the I in International Compliance Association is truly international. Um, and the map itself, the orange pieces, demonstrate where we have groups of students, and the blue uh, elements are where we run face-to-face -face workshops for those students. 
And actually, the top right-hand corner is a little bit out of date. We talk and have talked for some time now about having 100,000 certifications and qualifications globally. That's probably pushing up to around about 120,000 now. Um, so I need to get on and, and update the slide. So you are truly looking at a range of qualifications that are international, that are global in their perspective, that are recognized across a range of industries. Now, this slide seeks to show you um, exactly the fields that we operate within. So if we look at the columns, first of all, you can see that there is a blue column of qualifications under the heading of regulatory compliance. And you can also see that there are two shades of pink under the headings financial crime compliance. So if you then look at the two shades of pink, that adds up to three columns. And those are the three disciplines that you're going to hear about today from our three presenters from international compliance training. Um, you will also notice that it effectively operates in four levels. You can see those four arrows coming in on the left-hand side. So starting at the bottom with our most junior qualifications, but I say junior in that they tend to be introducing the subject matter to somebody who hasn't necessarily had exposure to that subject matter. Um, we get a whole cross-section of people on the programs because at the end of the day, you might be a CEO who wants to know about sanctions and therefore that program will provide an introduction to you. But it's for somebody that's assumed to have no knowledge in that area. Um, we're concentrating primarily today on the second level, third and fourth. Those are the levels where there are um, workshops involved in the programs, blended learning processes available online, and formal qualifications at the end. And on that right-hand side of the uh, visual, you'll see reference to benchmarking. So some of you will know the higher education qualification framework system. You will know that a level seven is a master's qualification. A level six is the equivalent of a third year bachelor's qualification. And a level four tends to be the qualification level for the majority of professional qualifications and a first year bachelor's. So our qualifications are benchmarked against those levels. And you will have spotted on an earlier slide our relationship with Manchester Business School. So Manchester validates those qualifications. So in other words, they assess our quality assurance processes, they sample the work that we do. That means that at the end of it, you know you have a qualification that is not only issued by a professional body, but also has been benchmarked in a way that you have either 80 master's level credits at the top or 120 credits at bachelor's level um, for an appropriate approved prior learning process elsewhere. If you want to know more about that, you're probably getting ahead of yourself because you're finding out about the basics, but some people like to know the whole pathway. That's one of the questions that you can ask the guys when they go through that in a little bit more detail. So that is probably the single most important, as I said, the most complicated visual you'll see today, and that's the one that, as I'll come on to, that generates the two most significant questions that we get asked. And I will touch upon those questions and give you a steer on how best to answer them. The other bit that I wanted to introduce to you today, because it is relatively new, is that ICA have now started to articulate exactly what is our mission as an organization. And if you have done qualifications with us before, this will also be new to you. Effectively, we recognize that when people are taking a professional qualification, we are literally changing the world one person at a time. And that sounds sort of grand, doesn't it? But let's just think about this for a second. Um, what I draw your attention to in that phrase is the stable and successful phrases. And it's probably better demonstrated by this triangle. So this is how we are thinking about it. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because today, this could be you starting on this triangle journey. So what we're effectively saying is that when professionals are inspired and educated to the highest of standards, that they in turn hold their firms and organizations to the highest of standards. Now, depending upon which discipline you are in, if you are in the world of financial crime compliance, clearly every single opportunity you have to stop 
counter finance terrorism, to stop uh, uh, money laundering, all those things are effectively contributing towards a more stable world. Conversely, if you're in the regulatory compliance space and you are helping your firms to do the right thing the right way, you are contributing to economic growth that leads to success. So don't underestimate the fact that you are part of a bigger community here and that you count. We were in this very hotel yesterday evening with a number of our members and uh, uh, Ross, you're here somewhere. Uh, they're, they're Ross, who is a uh, uh, counter-finance terrorism specialist, was presenting to our members about the significance of the information that you provide and how that can help on the front line in some terrifying situations. So we just want to make the connection here. This is not about briefing you on a qualification today. This is about starting you on potentially a journey or continuing your journey to the next level. So I said there are two questions that we are often asked. Here's the first one. Um, which discipline is right for me? So if we take those three areas, I guess you're probably thinking uh, in your situation, which discipline is right for me? And I'll, clearly, I'm not going to be able to answer that from the stage for all of you. As each of the guys present, they'll have time at the end for two or three questions, and by all means, throw those questions out. However, you probably have also spotted that in the coffee area, we have a number of stands conveniently labelled up with these headings so you know who to go and talk to during the coffee break if you want more information. Here's my generic uh, guidance to you. The scope and scale of your role will dictate which is best for you. And what we tend to find is that, generally speaking, if people work in smaller firms, their jobs tend to have a much wider scope, and actually you could be having a role that deals with all the regulatory compliance, all the financial crime compliance, and possibly everything else as well. And the larger the firm that you work in, the more likely those disciplines are separated and therefore you're in a team of one of those areas. Of course, the other factor is your seniority. So depending on where you are in the hierarchy of your organisation, depends whether or not you have a strategic overview, a day-to-day -day operational responsibility, or somewhere in the middle. And by all means, talk to the team outside. You'll find the tutors that you'll begin to recognise. You'll also find lots of people in blue and pink T-shirts who are qualified to ask you questions that will lead you to the answer of which discipline is right for me. The other question is which level is right for me. So having worked out which column you're in, think then about which row am I in. And I'll go back to the definitions on the left-hand side. Um, for the... Lower level qualifications, if I can call them that, the two lighter blue ones, there are no entry criteria required. Um, we do recommend that you either have a background or you're working in this area or you have a career ambition in this area because there are some application reports to write. And the advanced certificate, that level four, is, is best aimed at people who are doing the role as a practitioner in a team. If we move up to the level six qualification, that tends to be people who are doing the role as practitioners, but they are in also involved in the strategic policy writing or managing others type of role. And then at level seven, you're probably in a senior management role or possibly even in an executive role. And one of the things that influences people in deciding which level to go for is exactly how am I going to be assessed? Um, because there are going to be some work-life balance, time management decisions. Let's face it, you're not exactly in the, uh, the simplest of roles on a day-by-day -day basis. I'm sure it, most people work very long hours and actually taking additional learning on top of that does require you to think very carefully about that. So to, again, to give you a sense, the most junior qualification, the certificate, and remember what I said earlier, this could cover a whole range of people, is dealt with by way of online learning and online testing. As you move up, it becomes significantly more challenging. So the certificate level requires the written assignment and an examination. The diploma level, which is actually our most popular level of program by numbers of people that we have through the program, um, is completed by two written assignments and a, a, a stretching examination. And the professional postgraduate diploma is fairly specialised and I would recommend we hold fire until the guys uh, talk about their disciplines. They'll tell you a little bit about how that works. Um, but that is a whole different process where you end up writing a thesis 
and also go through an, a, a, an oral interview process akin to doing a doctorate. So that kind of challenge to your competencies and your background and your understanding. So I guess already you're starting to recognise the, the, the area that you want to explore in a bit more detail. Uh, in closing my bit, I want to mention the fact that you are part of a professional community. So as you join and sign up for your qualification, you begin that journey as an ICA affiliate. So you get access to all the professional body resources, all of those are designed to help you in your studies. When you have completed the qualification, you then have the option of continuing your membership, which we thoroughly recommend that you do, um, for reasons I'm going to come on to in one second. And depending on which qualification you have done, you can then become an ACA, a MICA, or a FICA. ACA being an associate, MICA being professional member, and FICA being fellow of the association. Um, the other side of that visual that I drew your attention to has all those levels of membership on it and all the things that you would get as part of that level of membership. So you can see that visual being reproduced. There's lots of boxes that are going to appear on here, but what I would emphasize is that you have a huge amount of resources that will be provided for you so that when somebody says to you, hey, you need to write an assignment in this particular area, all the current thinking interviews with thought leaders, webinars from tutors, um, uh, conference speakers that have been edited down just to get their key messages across, members' events like the one that I described to you last night, all of that is at your fingertips. There's approximately 7,000 pieces of learning that you have access to that's been added to and updated all the time. You'll be pleased to hear we've got a great filtering system. So you can actually say, what am I interested in? What level am I interested in? What jurisdiction am I interested in? And that will take it down to something manageable for you. But you can untick all those boxes and find out everything that is there for you at all times. And we also have something called your golden envelope. Uh, as a student, every workshop you go to, you will receive a golden envelope. And that golden envelope will have materials in it that will help you at that stage in your learning journey. But at this point, I'm going to leave that there and not talk any more about the golden envelopes. I've got to keep something in suspense as we go through the presentation. Um, I mentioned, and I guess I'm now getting ahead of ourselves, um, I mentioned that um, you'd want to stay cutting edge. One of the trends that we have found in the last couple of years, I guess in the UK this has been driven by the senior manager and certification regime, but elsewhere other regulators are following this trend, is that people are saying, hey, you've done a qualification, that's great, but three, five, six years on, how up to date are you really? Now, nobody at this stage, regulators or otherwise, are mandating what you need to do to, prov to prove that you are cutting edge. So we, like a number of professional bodies, are giving you an optional solution. Um, the call is quite simply this. You complete the qualifications, and then on a tri-annual basis, you have the option to refresh and update that qualification for a fraction of the cost of the original qualification. So what happens is you do your qualification, you do your assignments, you do your exam, somebody says congratulations, you come to a graduation ceremony, it looks something like that, uh, and, uh, and you walk away and think, fantastic, I've arrived. Um, and then for the next two years, we ask you to keep up to date with 35 hours worth of continuous professional development, or CPD, of which 20 hours is in your discipline. And having done that, when the third year comes around, you have the option of um, enrolling on a sort of slimmed down version of your qualification where you get access to all the original materials but the updated versions and a workshop that will support you. Um, there is a small cost associated to that, obviously, because all those things are available uh, to you. And then if you go through the assessment at that, pro that time, you can then say, hey, look, this is really cutting edge, this is really current. So for those of you who are in roles where the regulators require that, be aware that your qualification fits into that regime. And that's why. So that briefly summarises what I've just been talking about. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Becca. He, in turn, uh, will hand over to my colleague, Lee. So by the end of that, you will know everything you need to know about financial crime and anti-money laundering. We'll hear from Robert Walters, then we'll take a coffee break, and then come back and look at the world of governance, risk, and compliance.